Hello, wrestling fans. This is Brickhouse Baker, 2008 New England Hall of Famer. I need you people to do me a favor. I need you to go to Chops Video and subscribe to his YouTube channel. Again, that's Chops Videos. Go check this out because this guy's got some really good stuff from back in the day. Peace out. I am the Underground King, SWB, New England Hall of Famer, Tesla Strength founder and head coach. Looking for classic wrestling videos? featuring New England Hall of Famers and legends. Check out Chop's videos on YouTube. You too can be baptized by blood, fire, and barbed wire. Yo, this is Balls Mahoney, man. I guess you're watching me on New England Independence, a brand new wrestling show where all the hungry young talent from New England, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, anybody who's hungry enough to come up here and perform are here to perform for you. So I say you tune in to your local cable station or your local public access and you check it out because I'm not going to be the only name up here. You can expect guys like the Sandman. You can expect guys like Jason Knight's ACW crew. You can expect USA Pro and UCW guys to come on up here and perform for you. And all the New England hungry talent. Pull up a chair, sit down, get yourself a cold drink and relax and enjoy the show. Jose.
Thanks a lot, Balls. Thanks. Here's a uh, vertebrae guy. You uh, hung out with Balls a lot and knew Balls, didn't you? You must yeah, have I did. some cool did. Balls stories. Balls, man. Balls was a great guy. Uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, actually involves, uh, you know, Joe Borges. Uh, me and Balls, we had, uh, well, to, to, to lead into it, we had worked, we had, a, I had like a, a weekend with like six or seven shows in the one weekend, you know? And it ended up with like early in the morning, we had a NWA New England show. And then uh, myself, Jason Rumble, Bo Douglas, and Tony Kazina drove down to an assault championship wrestling show for uh, Jason Knight. And I'm down in the bar and Balls is sitting in the bar. So I sit down, I have, I have a couple shots with Balls. And uh, somehow my best friend comes up and I'm like, yeah, man, my best friend, he's a big fan of yours. You know, fucking, he'll be pissed that he missed you tonight. And uh, Ball says, well, let's call him. All right. So I call up Joe and Joe's like half asleep. I'm like, Joe, what's up? He's like, what's up? And without saying anything, I'm just like, hey, bro, somebody wants to talk to you. And I just hand the phone right to Balls, right? <laughs> so Balls gets on the phone. He's like, Joe, what's up? Joe says, who's this? He says, it's Balls. Balls? Yeah. Balls Mahoney. Balls Mahoney, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> you know, like, but that was just the kind of guy John was, man. Like, like you heard a fan wanted to talk, you know, would be miss mad that he missed him. Call him up. Let's talk to him. Dude, him and him and fucking him and Joe must have talked for about 10 minutes, just fucking bullshitting back and forth. And then uh, I get on the phone with Joe and Joe's like, the fuck, bro? <laughs> and that started a long list of me pranking Joe, just calling him from shows with fucking wrestlers on the phone. <laughs> like, But uh, John was a great guy, man. Jo John was a... Uh, he was definitely fan centric, man. Had no problem talking to fans. He loved fans. He was a good dude, man. It was I was sad when he died, man. John was a good dude. Like, what do you say, balls? Who? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just like, hey, bro. I guess somebody wants to talk to you. Hey, hey, Joe. Who's this? Balls. Balls? Who? Balls Mahoney. <laughs> oh, balls. What's up, fuck? What's up, balls? <laughs> you know. Then, uh, I think one of the funniest stories isn't directly balls, but it's. Balls related for sure. Uh, this is right after um, the one year anniversary show for Primal Conflict. And we all knew the spot was coming where uh, Scarecrow was going to get hit by balls, you know. But uh, me, Joe, and uh, I believe Kevin Charisma, we go outside to do our little gimmick, you know. We're standing out back. And, man, we're on the other side of the building. You know, like, we're, we're outside. Doors are closed. We're, we're, we're well away from where the arena part is. And... Uh, we heard the chair shot, bro. <laughs> we heard the chair shot. And Kevin Charisma goes, what the hell was that? And uh, Joe goes, I think Scarecrow just got killed. <laughs> yeah. And that was, uh, I'm sure you've got a story from Scarecrow regarding that chair shot, man. But yeah, we heard that shit. We heard that shit outside, around the corner, down the, down the way. I'm pretty sure somewhere down the Mass Pike they heard that shit. Like that was, that was a chair shot from hell, man. That was a fucking funny time too, but uh. Do you know yeah, that I, was? Do you know that was his first chair shot? Yeah, he didn't want to tell. He didn't want to tell Donnie that it was his first one though. I fucking I remember. Uh, I remember after that show, man. After Scarecrow took that shot, I was talking to Donnie on the phone, and I said, "Donnie, you know I'd do anything for you, right?" He goes, "Yeah." I said, "Donnie, I'm not taking a balls chair shot," and he goes. I wouldn't do that to you, bro. <laughs> and I'm like, good, because I'm not taking a ball straight shot. <laughs> There's no way. I'll do some crazy shit in that ring, man. I'll set myself on fire. I'll, I'll do some. I'm not taking a ball straight shot, dude. Fuck that. Luckily, I never had to because, bro, I, I just I can't even, like, I got to give Scarecrow all the credit in the world, man, because John could swing a chair. And uh, I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that chair shot. He told that story, and he's like, Oh yeah, I take chair shots all the time, like for fun. You know what I mean? I he goes, I just play it off. What am I gonna say? No. He's like, Yeah, of course I'll take a chair shot from Balls Mahoney. I see him on TV all the time. I take yep. chair shots for breakfast or whatever he said. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I I think I found out that he didn't uh, he had never taken a chair shot from one of your videos. I think that's where I. I oh I, yeah. I, I, yeah, so you've seen the clip of him saying it, then it's funny as hell. Yeah, yeah, because he's like, oh, what am I going to do? Tell him I've never taken a chair shot before. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you, funny definitely gotta get, says it. you definitely got to get Joe's side of that fucking story with the phone call because he could probably tell it a lot better than I can because I don't really know, you know, the interaction between those two once once the whole balls who happened. I, I don't know what – I don't even know what they talked about, bro. <laughs> like, but, I mean, that was John. Just get on the phone and have a good time, you know, like. 
he was a good dude, man. Real approachable. Real sad that he's gone. Real sad that he's gone. Yeah, I've been trying. This is Chris Andrews, formerly known as the Scarecrow, commenting on the Primal Conflict show in Wakefield. So I was reminded, not that I had to be reminded of this, but this was the one where I took the chair shot from Balls Mahoney. So, so I get there and, uh, you know, all of a sudden I have like, the, you know, I think it was the first match, but I'm working with Sam. And they ask me, they say, hey, uh, have you ever taken a chair shot before? Now, I had never taken a chair shot before, but I'm not going to say that I never took a chair shot before. So I go, yeah, chair shot. I do that kind of stuff all the time. I take chair shots at home just for kicks, you know what I mean? So at any rate, they're like, okay, great, cool. Are you comfortable taking a chair shot from Balls Mahoney? Am I comfortable? I go, that's, <laughs> I saw this guy on TV. Of course I'll take a chair shot from Balls Mahoney. And uh, so... We, I can't exactly remember how it was set up, but like I was, you know, presented as a heel, I think, for the first match. I actually twisted my ankle in the first match with Sam. I think I was trying to do a moonsault or some sort of like flip action or whatever like that. I landed funny and that didn't feel too good, but I was like, eh, what do I need an ankle for to take a chair shot? So later in the show, I'm the heel, you know, Balls is obviously the gigantic face. And it's some sort of thing where it's like, you know, uh, I turn around and Balls is there and he waffles me. And I, uh, you know, I remember I do it nice and slow. I remember the crowd was super hot. And he hits me with this chair shot. Now, because I was such a fan and because I was so, you know, <laughs> had such integrity, of course, I refused to put my hands up. Uh, nowadays, or not that long after that, I would probably put my hands up. Because if you're thinking about it, in reality, if someone's about to hit you over the head with a chair, you wouldn't just sit there with your hands at your at your hips, you would put your hands up. But back then, forget about it. So I refused to put my hands up, of course. And balls absolutely lights into me. And the it was, I got hit. There was a flash of white light. And then I was on the ground. And like, I wasn't unconscious when I was on the ground. But the trip from standing upright to flat on my back, I don't like, it. like it didn't happen. Just like a flash, and I lost like a half second. All of a sudden, I was just on the mat. So, you know, obviously, it was a pretty good shot. Uh, you know, crowd is ballistic. I crawl out of the ring. Um, when I go to get out of the ring, I like fall down to the ground. I, I don't walk to the exit. So the locker room was actually really nice. It was, you know, it's never a locker room in these indie, indie shows. It's just like a room. But this was a room that was nice. It had plenty of space and privacy, which is rare. You know, privacy from the wrestlers in the crowd, you know, not from each other. But, you know, so I, I go down the stairs and I knew that the crowd could still see me like a little bit. So I throw myself down the stairs. I was really into it. I throw myself down the stairs and I actually got like one of the like the workers or like the stage guy or the uh, ring guys are like, oh, my God, are you OK? And I'm like, dude, I'm, <laughs> I'm a pro wrestler. <laughs> I'm working here. So it's like, oh, OK. But like that was just great. And um Someone actually snapped a picture, and here it is. And you can see, obviously, my hands are down by my hips, and the bend in the chair from where it hit my head. Uh, and that is, like, that's legit. So right there, boom, then all of a sudden I was on the ground. So someone was nice enough to take a pretty professional-looking picture, and, you know, that still hangs in my house to this day. Um... Oh, let me tell you a good story about balls. So afterwards, uh, there was some sort of charity show in Somerville, and which is great because it's right near my house. But Balls is working it and Jamie Payne's working it, and the three of us are having a three-way match. Now, you want me to talk more about this show, I can do that, but real quick. So we're planning the match out, right? And Balls comes up with a spot <clears throat> where I'm going to hit him over the chair three times in a row, or two times in a row, and then the third time he'll kick out and, you know, whatever. Uh, kick me in the face or something like that. And he goes, and listen, man, you got to make these chair shots super hard. Like, because like I got over on you, like in Wakefield and like, you know, you got to get over on me, like to get me back. And I just, I look, I go balls. 
it's a charity show. And like, you know, the internet was pretty young. I'm like, no one remembers that. Like, no one was there. Like, we don't have to keep this storyline going from Wakefield. He's like, no, man, no, no. Like, I got you really good, man. And you got to get me, like, even better. So I'm like, okay. So I hit him, the, you know, we go through the thing. I hit him the first time, and he's, like, hurting. Like, I got him real good. He rears up. Rrr. I hit him the second time. And, like, he, I think he had already gigged. And he is, like, I, he's lean, leaned over. I can see blood pouring out. He's making this really bad noise. <laughs> And you can hear me, I'm screaming, I'm like, don't get up, don't get up, because like, don't make me do this again. And he gets up and it, it was just like, oh my God, this guy is freaking committed. So he was worried about, at a Cherry show, he was worried about me getting a receipt on him for that Wakefield show. So, hey man. Like I said, you want to hear some more stories about that charity show down the road, you can let me know. But in cases of primal conflict, that's just a story of how sort of committed Balls was to just wrestling and committed Balls was to, like, quite frankly, the guys he worked with. I mean, I was an absolute nobody, and he had, did not have to do that, and he totally did. So I appreciate it. All right, dudes, that's all I got for this. Any questions, give me a buzz. See you later. So, uh, Balls Mahoney, how did you first meet Balls Mahoney? Oh. Balls Mahoney, I mean, obviously, my trainer was Jason Knight. He was an ECW original, and uh, he had a school in Waterbury. And, uh, you know, back, I mean, that's what, early 2000s. And ECW was still fresh, even though uh, it, was, it, was, it was on the last run when I came into the business. So, when ECW went out of business... You know, Jason was bringing in all the ECW guys. So, and and that's the era where, you know, I came from. And EC, like I said, ECW was still fresh. People still wanted ECW, wanted new to talent still. And at the time, uh, Jason had the school Waterbury and he was started doing TV tapings just for us students, just to have, you know, for the local access TV. And we'd have two, three matches, you know, whatever on a Friday night to get ready for Tuesday night TV. And uh, it was me versus um, he set up, a, it was like a three, it was a three, it was like a three-way hardcore match with me, uh, Ron Zombie, and uh, a friend of mine, uh, we ended up tagging Pat Gunner. And the surprise <laughs> fourth uh, guy in the match was Paul Mahoney. <laughs> and that was my first time meeting him, you know, getting in the ring with him. And uh, he, I guess the night before he had a match, I don't know where the hell he worked. All I remember is he had this freaking chunk missing out of his forehead from all the gigging and stuff. And he still had a fresh gig there. And uh, he was like, just open it up. You know, we started working him. Uh, I have it on video somewhere. You know, videotape. I don't know if anybody still has any of those VHS. <laughs> but... Oh, I do. I got plenty. Believe me, that's what I've been putting up. I got lots. Yeah. I mean, we had a good match. I mean... You know, I took a couple bumps from him. He gave me an elbow or whatever. I don't, I don't remember the ending and stuff. But that was my first interaction and in time meeting balls. And he's come to train at the school a few times. And um, I ended up having like a, a five, a 10-man hardcore match where he was on my team. I was like the surprise fifth guy. And I remember that night like it was yesterday. And before the mat, before the show, like he pulled me aside and kind of talked about, you know, what we we're going to go on that night. And he said to me, Jason is really putting me over. And he was talking about like just the hard work I was putting in the training and then just I, my passion for, you know, trying to get better. And that was my night. And, and I'm sure you've been around the business for a long time. So, you know, I'm sure you've had experiences in the business where, at the time, you didn't know what the fuck was going on till like 20 plus years later. You're like, 
damn how important that night was or how much it meant. And, you know, it changed everything in your life, you know, you know, maybe, you know, you you, you did stuff. You never did anything in the ring. Have you like, if you trained no, at all? No, I was never in the ring. No, nope. I was always so, outside the ring around the ring, mostly a fan, but I work behind the scenes, a lot of mostly cameraman. And I helped out some book with some booking and stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm sure you've come across, you know, a lot of people in your time and, probably a lot of them have passed by now too you know and oh yeah and i'm sure i'm sure you've had interactions with them and you're like damn i can't believe that was 20 years ago and how much that meant to you you know well, that's why i do this video thing in the tribute that's why i'm doing this stuff that's why yeah. i'm putting these videos up because i want it out there for these people before i die or before you know i my girlfriend throws them out or whatever you know what i mean like i i opened the closet one day and i'm like just stumbled across them. I hadn't been in wrestling. I haven't gone to a wrestling show since 2004. I was like done with wrestling. I was kind of like uh, over it. You know? years. Yeah. And uh, oh. then I started cleaning out my closet and ran across the wrestling tape. And I was talking online to a buddy and he's like, oh, you got that match put it on online. I said, I don't know how to do that. This was like 10 months ago. I was like, I don't know how to upload a video or take it from VHS and put it on I don't know how the fuck to do that. You know what I mean? I'm I'm 50 yeah. years old. I don't know how to do that shit. And uh, I Googled it. And this is everything you've seen online. I've learned in 10 months, just Googling and messing around, you know? It's, and, it's and amazing. The appreciation from the boys was just, wow, these people want this stuff. Like people like my son's never seen me wrestle. Thank you so much for putting this up and, and stuff like that. And then I started seeing how many people had passed and uh, like Anthony Rufo, it's like, I have so much of this stuff that friends and family haven't seen in 20 years, you know? So it's like, yeah. man, I have to put this stuff out there just, just for that reason. We'll say I die tomorrow and this stuff gets thrown in a dumpster. You know, this it's stuff awesome. has to be out there. It's That's treasure. How I feel. You it know, has to be. Out there. Uh, um, I just had a message. Uh, yeah, it's it's you don't want it, it wanted to become lost treasure because like I said, it'll shit will get thrown out. And a lot of the experiences, like I said, you know, talking about balls is you know, I've spent a lot of time with them in the locker room, you know, around them, and you know, and it, it, it's sad to, in some ways because it's like you see a lot of people, like a lot of what I've learned in the wrestling business very early on is you know, you see a lot of these guys have all this success and you see all of these guys on TV, you think you have money and stuff like that. But then you start seeing the darker side of the business and the ring. And, and that what's one of the reasons why it caused me to kind of walk away after a couple of years. It's like, that's all they have. And, you know, once they, you know, they're, they don't have the spotlight anymore. They're doing all these indie shows. They don't have a regular job and whatever they do for autograph signings and shows on the weekends. I mean, they can't, right? I mean, how much could they possibly live on a week? I mean, you get a hundred dollars. You can't live on that. So I started seeing, like I said, the darker side of the business. It's kind of starting to see a lot of these guys kind of deteriorate, deteriorate, deteriorate you know, I can't even say the word, but, <laughs> but, um, but then seeing ball, like I ran into him years later at a show we did in Danbury. He got booked and I was like, balls. And he remembered me and it was, it was awesome. It was a great time, but this is like, Years before he passed and actually got sick. I mean, there was a time where you he got sick, like he lost a lot of weight. Like, I don't think he did it the right way. I don't know what was wrong, wrong with him, but or up with him, but it's sad to see good guys that were at top of the world kind of end up with nothing. You know, uh, and I feel bad. I know his son is uh, I think going to college now. I'm like, damn, I, I mean that's I remember when he was born. <laughs> You know, that's how much time has passed. and But he was always a good guy to me. I mean, it was always great to listen to. He treated everybody well. And I don't know if you ever, if you watch, no, I should have sent you the video. But the, he, he baptized me the night that I won the hardcore title. He did a quick promo and he goes, I ain't going to hit you with a chair because I love you, but I'm going to baptize you. And he stuck a thumbtack and pushed <clears throat> right into my forehead. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was baptized hardcore that night. That was 20, 20 years ago. Yeah, he, he was great. I mean, I was nobody, and he always did anything I wanted, promos. I mean, backstage, I go backstage, he'd sit there and, man, telling stories and promos and, you know, just like you were somebody. Always treated you like you were somebody, 
no matter who you were. And he didn't know me from Adam, you know, from anybody. Yeah. I wasn't even a worker. And he was never like, who the fuck are you? Or what are you doing back here? Or, hey, sit down, man. And he start telling me a story and, hey, hey, hand me my bag, you know, whatever. Want promo? Sure. Let's go over here. Let's do this. No, you know what we're going to do? He'd have some big story, you know. I know the perfect spot. And we'd have to go out and he'd, he'd have it all laid out. He, yeah. He was, he was great like that. From what I experienced with a lot of the ECW guys was that's how they all were. You know, they were great. Yeah, for me, I, I met, you know, Boz Mahoney came to another show afterwards and we got to hang out a little, but that was the first time I ever met any, uh, you know, talk, Tommy Dreamer. And like I said, that he was super cool. Uh, New Jack, I, you know, I mean, I talked to him here and there at the shows and stuff. It's like, I mean, he was not going to know who I am if I saw him on the street or anything, but, you know, he, and, but he was always a cool, he was always a nice guy. And, uh, but the, like I said, the only guy that ever came in that was a dick was that Bill Vis Wesley dude. Like, who the fuck are you, dude? You 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 ain't no one. Like, Bill Vis Wesley, and he's big league in there, all of us and shit. Like, I, I can't remember what he did. He did something that was like everyone was like, "Fuck him," and I just don't remember what it was. But yeah, fuck that guy. <laughs> Bill Vis Wesley fought Balls Mahoney in like a regular wrestling match, and then later Balls Mahoney come out and chair shotted. Uh, Scarecrow, like, oh, yeah, when, crap. When you, when you said they had a regular, it's funny because when you said they had a regular match, I was like thinking, that's why I pointed. I'm like, I remember the fucking chair. And then you said chair shot. I'm like, yeah, I remember because I was in the back and I remember him. He was like zip tying his chairs. Like, and he was fucking, he was fucking leveling people. Like, he, he had his chair, he had it painted up and everything because he sold it afterwards, I think. But he had it like zip tied close and he was fucking. I don't know. He zip tying them so they wouldn't fucking open up, and he was fucking he leveling people with that shit. And I remember yeah, someone pe people were standing there and letting them take it. Oh, it's Bulls Mahoney. Yep, you can hit me as high as you want. You know. And he was. I, mean, he was, I don't know. You know, there's no fake in that fucking chair shot to the head, man. And you, you take that fucking thing, you, you're hurt. <laughs> well, it was funny because they asked him, Scarecrow, had you ever taken a chair shot? And he was like, yeah, I'd taken a chair shot. He said he had never taken a chair shot before that. And uh, he didn't want to say that because he liked, he watched ECW and was a fan of ECW and Balls Mahoney. What's he yeah. going to say? No. And he yeah. said he didn't want to put up his hands and like disrespect him or anything. So he didn't put his right. hands up or anything. He took that chair shot full blunt for his first chair shot. Jesus. I remember, see, I remember the chair afterwards because he sold it. He sold it afterwards. I, I don't remember how much for, like 300 bucks. And it was fucking completely dented and bent. Yeah. He was a cool guy, though, Balls. Yeah, so that's he, a gimmick he would have going. He'd waffle them as hard as he could so he'd bend them and then sell them to the fans. So he would zip tie them, bend yeah. them, and sell them. So he have to bend them. So, you know what I mean? If he didn't bend them, the fans would look at him. Oh, he didn't bend it. If he bent them, the yeah. fans would be like, whoa, look at this chair. All bent up, look how hard he hit him, you know. Quite the racket he's got going there. <laughs> Balls. 
Who are you going to take that chair and wrap around his head? The answer is I don't know and I don't care. Because, yeah, this is for the Red Cross. And, you know, they need their help with all the victims of everything that's gone on in America. So I'll do my part to make sure that someone tonight sheds some blood to donate. <laughs> and if you like to, you too can be baptized by blood, fire, and barbed wire. He was a trip. I mean, every time I was going to be on a show with him, Something interesting was going to happen. But some of the best memories I have of him would be when we'd have the after parties at some of the boys' houses. I mean, it'd be 2.30 in the morning, and we'd be having barbecues out there, and Balls would be on the grill making the cheeseburgers and stuff like that. But also, it was no secret that Balls had a pretty bad temper. There's even a very famous story with him in the big show. But there was this one night, in Lowell, Mass, we were bar hopping all, all around downtown. And it was me, Balls, Damian Darkside, and a few of the CZW guys. Now, Balls and Darkside got into a fight. I don't know what it was about, but knowing Darkside, he was just probably being really obnoxious, acting like he was the guy who knew everything about the business. But, now, it wasn't physical, just confrontational and... Thankfully, uh, Balls didn't stay mad that long. So anyway, uh, any, any time after that, it was always cool hanging out with Balls. I really miss him. Uh, wish he was still here. Balls, this one's for you, buddy. I got big balls. All right. I didn't know that song very well, but he'd, he'd probably be laughing about it, so he's out. Again, this time with Balls Mahoney from ECW, now with PCW. How are you doing, Les? How are you doing? Doing all right, man. It's good to be up here. It's great to have you with us, and um, it's been a long time since you were with ECW, and now we're kind of in a transition phase. Mm -hmm. And why don't you tell us and tell the audience how you came to be part of PCW, Primal Conflict Wrestling. Okay, well, as everybody knows right now, uh, and I can't tell you what is going on with ECW because I am definitely not sure of it. If I had an answer, I'd give it. If I, was, if I could get a dollar for every question, every time a fan asked me what's going on with ECW, I wouldn't have any money problems. But uh, basically what's going on with me, uh, I got a phone call from uh, New Jack and he told me about this company that's starting up. They're fledgling and they're, you know, and they're not drawing with money. They're willing to pay me, which is... It's independence, and hopefully these guys are going to go on to something else because you can use all the companies, you know, young guys need a place to work, but guys like me need a place to work too. So uh, I'm just happy to be able to work, you know, earn some, yeah. earn some money for my family, you know, pay the mortgage and the electric bill. And so I'm just hoping, you know, that this works out so I can come up here like at least cut three or four times a month and work, you know, every show you guys got. It'd be really nice, you know. So that's how it basically came to be. New Jack talked to his friend, his friend called me, and here I am. How did you come to be a professional wrestler, and specifically an ECW and now PCW wrestler? Okay, well, um, when I was 12 years old, I met Chris Candido, who I'm sure everybody mm -hmm. knows. And, uh, we grew up together uh, playing baseball and wrestling. His, his dad was, his uh, grandfather was a pro wrestler, so we would set up rings. We were 12 years old, we'd set up a ring, get it up, mm -hmm. and his grandfather would bring us to the room for, ring for three or four hours and beat the snot out of us. You're not doing it right. And we were trained. So by the time I was 15, me and Chris were 15, 16 years old, we put masks on and wrestled in the opening matches of these shows. Very illegal. <laughs> but we had the experience to do it. So as time progressed and we got better and better and better, I'm not talking strength or size or the hardcore, I'm talking wrestling. Mm -hmm. You know, pro wrestling, the real pro wrestling, you know? And the stuff that the little guys do, you yeah. know? And the stuff, like, like our, one of our assignments was the memorized Flair versus Steamboat from Starcade. Uh -huh where he was Flair and I was Steamboat. And then we had to switch it where I was Steamboat and he was, and it, you know what I mean? And yeah. that was part of our assignments to train. So we had to memorize these hour long matches and to be able to do them. Uh, so from there, I mean, all this time I'm in high school, I'm playing football and I'm wrestling. So I took, two, I took a year to my senior year in high school when I could have got licensed. I said, no, I'm gonna concentrate on football and wrestling so I can go to college. Uh, football didn't work out like I'd like it to. And I'm not gonna badmouth anybody anymore. 
uh, it's much my fault as anybody else's, but wrestling was working out, and uh, I wrestled in the Freestyle Junior Nationals that year after re regular season was over, and I won them, so I got picked up by the uh, head coach of Rutgers to go to Middlesex Junior College, but with the catch being, if I completed the year there, as he thought I could do, and I did well without losing, a, without losing more, less than three matches, I would get a ride to Rutgers to wrestle. I blew my knee out in the national qualifier, which I won the match, the final match in the national qualifier, and I was seated one in the nation because I was 30 and 0. But I had knee surgery on my right knee, and this was the fourth knee surgery I've had already. And I had to watch the nationals and watch the guy that I pinned pin his way through the national tournament. You know what that's like? You're knee up in your knee, and you're like, I killed him and I beat him, and I could, I, I, I was going to Rutgers, so that got me pulled. So I'm thinking, all right, what am I going to do? I need a job. Should I go back to pro wrestling? Let's try the Olympics. Let's, let's go for the national team. I'm a great freestyle wrestler. So I'm in the national tournament, and I'm in the semifinal match against a guy named Domingo Mesa. He was a Pan American Greco-Roman champion four times and a three-time freestyle Pan American champion. Uh, was a, could have been on the Olympic team, but lost out to Baumgartner pretty bad in a quarterfinal match. Well, I have him in the semifinals, and he butted me in the eye. You can see right here on the side mm -hmm. of the, of the uh, piercing mm -hmm. right here. This scar here is from him. Uh, he butted me in the eye, and they stopped the match, glued it real quick. I got mad. I'm going to crank this guy. And I had a move called the reverse headlock, which is legal, but it's very, very painful on the lower back because you basically have the guy. Right. I'm sitting out like this. I have the guy's arm here and his head and I got underneath, and you run it in a circle, and it puts pressure on his back, and the guy sits out. What he does, you bring him on his back, exposure, it's two points, and you can keep doing it. Well, as I hooked him, he came down with his elbow in my crotch. So I cranked him straight back and broke his back. The referee disqualified me in a legal hold. Excuse me, real quick. Hello? Doing an interview, call you back. Bye. That was my wife. Oh. <laughs> um, well, thank you. For thanks. So, uh, apologize to her for Yeah, us, no, don't worry. Um, <laughs> so I'm cranking her. I crank the guy. They disqualify me. I can't believe I'm upset. You know, and I'm like, why? Why are you doing this? I, I didn't mean to. You're a menace. I broke a guy's jaw with a cross face. I was rough. Wrestling's not a. It's a contact yeah, sport, yeah. and you're, and you know, you gotta win it. Sometimes it's physical. So I punch the referee in the mouth. Coach gives me the back. I punch the coach in the mouth. Lifetime ban. Amateur wrestling. So that was time to go to pro. Unbelievable. That's a true story. That gimmick. That's the gimmick in ECW, and that's a true story. Okay. You were inter uh, interrupted by your wife just now. Yes. Obviously, you have a wife and a family. Yes. Trying uh, to start the family. Trying, trying to get the little ones. Yeah, we want a little one. So, how do you decide to become an ECW wrestler and still do that? And 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 how do you ignore the WWF and the WCW where well, you could really be comfortable? Well, here's the thing. I'm not ignoring the WWF and the WCW. Right now, if they had made me an offer. You know, I, now it's at the point, like, I love wrestling. I love professional wrestling. It's what I do. It's my job, and I love it. But this is a business now. I have a, I have a mortgage. I have bills. I have a wife. I want to start a, a family. I want kids. And you can't do that. I'm no offense to anybody, but you cannot do that just working show to show to show. You need a job. So my ultimate goal right now is if ECW does not start back up is to get a job with one or two. I mean, I would much prefer WWF it is the place to be. There is so much money there for to be made by everybody as long as you work hard. But right now, I don't know what's going on. I have feelers out, and hopefully someone will be taken. But in the meantime, you know, and as far as ECW goes, I love ECW. I'll stay with you. If ECW starts up tomorrow, I'm with ECW. I love that. And how do you get there? You just do it. I've always been a little nuts, you know. I love as much, you know. As much as people say, well, you must get paid to go through that barbed wire and the thumbtacks. No, I, that was fun. <laughs> I like fun. I'll roll around the thumbtacks now. you got to be a little twisted to like kind of stuff like that. You, know? you project very much close to like Mick Foley to yeah. me. You, you, do people ever tell you that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I look just like the guy, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, if, if people ask me if I'm Mick Foley or if they already know who I am, they go, are you related to Mick Foley? Right. But, yeah, I do project a little bit like him. Just, little, you know, he does, he did his thing because... That, he was good at that. He could absorb a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And he absorbed a lot of pain, but he didn't necessarily like it, whereas certain pain's kind of cool, you know? Like, I got piercings. Piercings are cool. Tattoos are really cool. In fact, you know, I got, I'm working on a back piece right now. Check this out. <laughs> this isn't being filled. It should be filled in in a month, so I'm working on this one. Right oh, my God. That's quite an intricate design there. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like duality of man. It's the demon that lives inside me trying to get out. So do you have one 
person that does all these designs or do you go to many different people? No, I have uh, the tattoo artist who's doing my this tribal work on my arm and all my work on my back is uh, Mike Swagger out of Slingin' Ink and, uh, not Slingin' Ink, excuse me, Barty Art World in Point Pleasant. And I have another guy, Big Jim Weiss, who does my piercing, who's going to do some tattoos for me too at uh, Slingin' Ink in Point. These guys are friends of mine, I know for a long time. <laughs> but they're also some of the best tattooists in New Jersey. Now we know that China from the WWF has a book out and we know that she speaks five languages. What are some of the other things outside of wrestling that you like to do? Okay, um, I'm a very good fisherman, uh, deep sea fisherman, charter boat fishing, uh, sharks, tuna, uh, bluefish, uh, the tarpon, any kind of deep sea fishing that you can catch marlin. I like to play golf. Um, Let's see, what else do I like to do? Video games, you know, keeps you in the house and keeps you broke. It keeps, keeps you from going broke and paying <laughs> bills. Uh, I'm an avid cook. Uh, I used to work as a chef. I'm a very good cook. In fact, there's a restaurant near my house called Rivoli's. If you ever, this is a plug for them, you'll never eat all the food they give you. They give uh -huh. you, they bring out a bowl like this. Where is this now? Tom's River, New Jersey. Okay. It's called Rivoli's Italian restaurant. You'll never eat all the food. You'll eat their pasta for three days. Well, he has four different dishes on his menu that I gave him. I just like try this and he loved it so much and he ha I, he has a dish called veal Mahoney. <laughs> Getting <laughs> that hungry. I it, that I made it. Some veal and a cream and a wine cream sauce with some uh -huh. lemon uh -huh. and some uh, little pinch of cayenne pepper, a lot of garlic over angel hair pasta with a little bit of sprinkle of Parmesan mm. and it is it's beautiful. That's great. And I love the barbecue and uh, I'm not really into a lot of like you know race car driving or anything. I'm a big football fan. Huge go Giants! Tiki Barber, I wore your jersey the first year I bought it. Yeah, big giant fan. Uh, football, amateur wrestling. I coach amateur wrestling, uh, recreation amateur wrestling. I'm not allowed to coach high school, <laughs> but I'm allowed to even now. Huh? Even now, I'm allowed to volunteer my time. So what right. we're trying to do with Manasquan right now, which is the high school I went to, uh, they have a rec program that only goes two days a week during the wrestling mm -hmm. season. What we're trying to do is raise some money. I'm gonna actually try to run a show, mm -hmm. so these guys can get their own mats because their facility will be done for, with the high school, uh, for the recreation you know, basketball gym, so we can use the gym too. But we have to get mats, so I'm trying to do a benefit organization down there. And if we get the mats, we're gonna actually rename it, you know, it's gonna be the Mask on Recreation, right, but we're gonna right, name right. it a club, so then I can have these kids all year round and take them to the freestyle tournaments and the Greco-Roman tournaments, and, and then in the, and in the summer they can wrestle guys from different states. And that's be stuck wrestling the same guys every time and do it four days a week. It's something like, because amateur wrestling is the best sport right. for uh, for children, I think. It's better than soccer. It's better than baseball. It's a team sport, but it's an individual sport. It teaches you a lot about life, that you can only rely on a team to such an extent. Right. You know, once you grow up and you have a wife and a kid, yeah. you ain't have nobody to rely on. You got yourself. And a lot of kids lose that fact, you know? And also in amateur wrestling, we don't put pressure on the kids to win. We just put pressure on the kids to improve. As long, I, I'd rather have a kid who will go out and get beat 15 and nothing, but try and fight off his back than have a kid who goes out and, and, and just like gets pinned right away. Because right. he doesn't care. All right. our kids, are, they, they try. I don't want, I don't care if they win. I just want, and they have, and I make it fun, you know? I don't have these kids right. doing, running miles. They're kids. I have kids six years old to 14. Just the fact that you're, you're teaching them how to care about something and try, that's the goal. Right, exactly. And, 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 they, and you can see, like when I first came this year, uh, it was it was just so cool because I I always taught kids to wrestle and it was just a whole new a whole new I I see their I teach them something and they because like, they know I'm a pro wrestler yeah and they go oh my god so we just in fact the season just ended Thursday I got there and they gave me a, a dinner gift certificate I was like no 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 <laughs> guys you can't I cried I had to leave I had to leave the actual thing but uh, that I guess means a lot to me as the kids I mean I'm not much of a role model I smoke I uh, used to be a pretty bad drinker and I'll probably start drinking again someday you know. Uh, I've had my problems, you know, I'm not actually, you know, I'm not actually... Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect, and I tell people, don't try to be like me, but if you listen to me, I can tell you some good stuff and some advice. Don't do as I do, do as I say. Well, I don't do anything to not, but yeah, exactly, I'm, you know, no... That's every, what my father used to right, say to me. Right, because no parent is, no parent is, is an angel. Exactly. You know, they went through the same thing there, because especially the kids, the, the parents are having kids now, they're not, you know... I never did drugs, you liar. I know every kid in my high school at one time was smoking pot when I was in there, you know? And, and, and I know some people have kids now and they're like, yeah, I don't do drugs and you shouldn't do drugs either. And I look at these parents and they're hypocrites, you know? And, and 
And I mean, it's, I mean, when they're young, you just tell them not to talk to the kids. The, most parents don't even talk to their kids. And I have about six or seven kids that call me at home, like they have my home number, and they talk to me because they know I'm not going to lie to them. They know that I'll answer to them straight, and their parents know it too, and they love me too. I have the, more of the parents like me than some of the kids. Some of the kids hate me. <laughs> well, I, I mean, whenever I practice, I'm like, all right, listen to me, listen, and they'll I'll do 20 push-ups, <laughs> you know, and I'll get them in shape. And they don't like me for that, but the parents do. None of the in fact, the parents are trying to get me to uh, coach high school wrestling yeah. because they want me to coach their kids next year in, the, in high school, and I can't do that, right. and they're pretty upset about that. Finally, I know you have to get going pretty soon. Um, let's talk about, I think your matches, back to the wrestling, okay. your matches are some of the most bloody I've ever seen anywhere on any old tape, anything. How did this come about, and um, how long can you keep this sort of thing up, do you think? Well... I bled my first match when I was 16. Uh, I don't know, you gotta be a little sick. You know, as I said before, you gotta be a little nuts to do this. You gotta be a lot nuts to do this on the stuff that I do. Uh, tonight, you probably don't expect blood. I'm wrestling uh, Bill Vis Wesley, uh, Billy Wiles of the old Dangerous Alliance. And he's a tough wrestler, so we're gonna have a wrestling match. But that doesn't to say next show you see me and there ain't gonna be some blood and some barbed wire. And can I do it? I can do this until I'm 90. I'm gonna be like Terry Funk. I will ask you what I asked New Jack. Have you ever been afraid for your life after one of these matches? You ever thought that this is it? Yeah. In Puerto Rico, I got attacked by a guy with a knife, a fan. And I was afraid for my life because I could have killed the guy. And by the time I disarmed him and tried to stab him, thank God one of the other wrestlers was there. Was I, but as far as something going on in the ring, yeah, a couple times. Uh, I have a broken neck. I have a broken C3 vertebrae. I lost all feeling in my legs uh, about a year ago, and I went to the hospital to get an MRI, and the doc's like, well, it's a broken neck. I'm like, what broken neck? And I didn't even know I had it. So for four years of ECW, all the chair shots I've taken, I've been taken with a broken neck. And it will never heal properly now. It's, uh, it's broken, there's a calcium deposit on top. So I'm scared every time I go in the ring, but the fear isn't a big thing, because if you're scared, you're gonna get hurt. Right. And if you don't give 100%, might as well not be in it. Well, thank you very much, Balls Mahoney, and uh, good luck in PCW and in much. your rest of your career. Thank you very much.